I was really angry when I found this stuff out because the, in the books it said he was court-martialed and all that sort of thing. It was not an undistinguished career. Um, and I talked to two of the other six pilots. One of them said, I've been waiting 50 years for this phone call. He was waiting for somebody to talk about what really happened there. And um, so what happened was that after they were all doing close formation and they separated and except for Stam and Cornelia. And one of them, for the quarter second it takes when you're wingtip to wingtip, did something stupid. Her wingtip hit the underside of his plane. The, the last six feet of her plane were wooden. Some of the planes, it was a quirk of manufacturing, mostly metal plane, wooden, wooden end, it broke off. She was apparently, from what they say, when, as they watched her go in, knocked unconscious because there was no evasive maneuver, no anything. She went straight and was killed. She had turned 24 a month earlier. Uh, and she was the first female pilot killed in active duty. The, uh, the service uh, at uh, Christ Church uh, Episcopal in Nashville was attended by the governor. We had a, a single governor at the time, and she had dated him. Um, her family knew everybody, you know, so senators and the Cream Society was there. And where I want to close before I just briefly talk about what happened afterwards, um, Cornelia wrote when she was on that ship out of uh, Honolulu. She knew that there were reports and fears of torpedoings and things, so she wrote her last will and the note to her mother and sort of dispensed with her good should something happen, and this was part of that. She talks a great deal about uh, flying. I dearly loved the airports, little and big. I loved the sky and the planes, and yet best of all, I loved flying. For it, too, was a deeply personal possession of the soul. I loved it best, perhaps, because it taught me utter self-sufficiency, the ability to remove myself beyond the keep of anyone at all. And in so doing, it taught me what was of value and what was not. It taught me a way of life in a spiritual sense. It taught me to cherish dignity and integrity and to understand the importance of love and laughter. For I have loved many people and many places and many things. And best of all, I have loved life, and especially American life. And if I can say one thing in truth, it is to my friends and my convictions I have brought all the loyalty and integrity of which I was capable. If I die violently, who can say it was before my time? I should have dearly loved to have had a husband and children. My talents in that line would have been pretty good, but if that is not to be, I want no one to grieve for me. I was happiest in the sky at dawn when the quietness of the air was like a caress, when the noon sun beat down, and at dusk when the sky was drenched with a fading light. Think of me there and remember me, I hope as I shall you. Love Cornelia. And so these women flew very well until toward the end of the war the men started coming back when we mopped up Europe. The pilots were coming back, they started going to the congressmen and saying, We want those jobs those women have. These women, the 1100, were called together into a big room and told, Thank you very much, now go home. Um, some of them offered to stay on for a dollar a year. Teresa James wanted to fly for the Chinese military, anybody who'd take her, they were told no. When the war ended and the airlines started up and it became big business, they would go to the airlines and say, we flew during the war, we'd like to be pilots. They were told, you can be stewards. Um, in 1977, finally, Barry Goldwater um, got legislation passed making them retroactive members of the U.S. military. When Cornelia died, or when the poorer girls died, they would have to, the girls would pass the hat for them. Cornelia, of course, had money, but um, there, were, there were no military death benefits. They passed the hat or did what they could. Um, and then, uh, but those, there's been a resurgence in the past, I want to say 20 years or so. Uh, there have been a number of books written about these women. Uh, there have been, uh, they show up more on things on PBS. I've been interviewed a couple of times for things like those. I'm really glad to see it. Um, Cornelia Ford was a heroine by any, uh, by any definition of the word. These women were too. And I'm really honored to have been able to share their story this evening as part of this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions anyone want to talk about? They, let me tell you this. Uh, they, uh, the last ferry B-17 is to hit the mm -hmm. That That's, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, no. they did. Yeah. They did before I got hurt in the midway by them. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody? Emmett got a hand in? Okay. Um, yes? It's an interesting fact that, that uh, in trading accidents in the U.S. before people went overseas, we lost about 15,000 in the Army Air Force uh, in training accidents. So it wasn't unusual. They were losing 30 or 40 um, fatal mishaps. Southwest, you see all these little triangular fields all over the place. They were they were flying any place that was clear skies. People were going to fly airplanes. Oh yeah, the the, the um, civil aviation. There, there was a there was a civilian pilot training program which took nine men for every woman. It, one one per ten could be a woman at the time, and that had trained a, a few hundred by the time it was time for this to happen. But they were they weren't but two hundred women in the country at the time who had the hours. And they were gradually trained, um, and a lot of the men um, had less time than the women at first. But they were flying bigger planes more quickly. Yes. After publishing your book, have you since heard from other people who knew uh, Ms. Ford? Uh, I uh, really did my best to track down as many as I could find at the time. I mean, I, I did a hundred or more interviews, and but I having I mean, people in Nashville, I would get people every now and then who would simply say, I used to see her flying over. You knew if a plane was going over a certain part of town, it was Cornelius. It just had to be. And you run into those people every now and then. Uh, and their family still, there are a lot of forts still in Nashville. And, uh, but still, it's amazing how many people, uh, I still speak quite a bit, and people, the, the name Cornelia Fort, the Cornelia Fort Airport, Airport, sounds like it was named for a fort. And so I mean, a lot of people miss it from the beginning. But, you know, this, I think those of us who, who care about history just sort of chip away at things like this. We get the word out as much as we can and hope for the best. Yes? Uh, in doing your research and your interviews are going through the records that you may have gone through uh, looked by the, the female pilots, was there any discussion, perhaps not even public, but amongst themselves, of wanting to perhaps try to have a larger role, not just as, you know, working as fair in the planes, but perhaps the discussion of taking a larger role. Uh, and what I'm thinking about is, were they ever aware or did they ever discuss perhaps the Soviet example, the Soviets using women as fighter pilots? Was that something that came up? Yeah, the night witches never came up uh, in this. Yeah, the Soviets had a pretty advanced uh, program for, for female pilots back then. And I've got a friend who, who did a book on, on them not long ago. Um, it's the same situation here where we've lost most, most of them. Um, but they. The women knew better than to press, except for Nancy and Jackie, who always were interested in upping the ante whenever they could. They always pressed for bigger planes, and you know Nancy would, would fly them first, and her senior women, and you know that sort of thing. But they had to make as few waves as possible, and so it was always through the right channels. And they did very little complaining. Uh, they just they were happy to be there and knew that it was not a guarantee they'd be there through the war. I've got a niece that flies for Southwest. They've got three lady pilots for Southwest Airlines. A lot of them know the story. Um, some of the female astronauts have known the story and have said very nice things about, about those women. Yeah. What kind of planes did they ferry to Europe? They, they didn't ferry to Europe. They had to stay within the continental United States. They would take them to uh, the bases where males would ferry them overseas. Um, you know, they, they never saw action and they couldn't go overseas. In fact, some who had flown Lend Lee stuff at the beginning of the war would actually go to the Canadian border and stop and someone else would take over and, and um, go from there. But they just flew within the continental the U.S. Yes? What was the average age of They went from, um, they had to be between 21 and 35. The Army didn't want minors or menopause to worry about. And, um, and, so, and they filled that whole range. There were some who were just barely 21, like Florine. And Betty Gillies, I think, was in her early 30s at the time. And there were two distinct schools. There was one, there were women who were wealthy enough to fly. There was a Woolworth heiress who walked into the barracks with a leopard skin coat on. There was an heiress to the Hyler uh, uh, Candy Company. 
uh, Luton, one of the cough drop companies had an heiress that went there. And then there were people like Teresa James and a few school teachers and things who traded out work at airports for lessons whenever they could. And so they were two distinct groups. And in fact, Teresa James said that the poor girls used to call the the room of whichever the rich girls happened to be in at the time, the DuPont Lounge, because the DuPont family would always bring, the, you know, the, the pilots they knew over for dinner. They lived close by in um, Delaware. And so Teresa called their own rooms the Waldorf Astoria. <laughs> she was a pistol. I, I, I wish, you know, I, she were here to bring on tour. <laughs>